The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow Read for LibriVox.org by Bridget Rafferty Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere on the 18th of April in 75. Hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. He said to his friend, If the British march by land or sea from the town to-night, Hang a lantern aloft in the belfry arch of the north church tower as a signal light, one if by land and two if by sea, and I on the opposite shore will be, ready to ride and spread the alarm through every Middlesex village and farm, for the country folk to be up and to arm. Then he said good night, and with muffled oar, silently rode to the Charleston shore, just as the moon rose over the bay, where swinging wide at her moorings lay, the Somerset, British man of war, a phantom ship with each mast and spar, across the moon like a prison bar, and a huge black hulk that was magnified by its own reflection in the tide. Meanwhile his friend through alley and street wanders and watches with eager ears, till in the silence around him he hears the muster of men at the barrack door, the sound of arms and the tramp of feet, and the measured tread of the grenadiers marching down to their boats on the shore. Then he climbed the tower of the old north church, by the wooden stairs with stealthy tread, to the belfry chamber overhead, and startled the pigeons from their perch on their somber rafters that round him made, masses and moving shapes of shade, by the trembling ladder steep and tall to the highest window in the wall, where he paused to listen and looked down, a moment on the roofs of the town, and the moonlight flowing over all. Beneath in the churchyard lay the dead, in their night encampment on the hill, wrapped in silence so deep and still, that he could hear, like in sentinel's tread, the watchful night wind, as it went creeping along from tent to tent, and seeming to whisper all is well, a moment only he feels the spell of the place and the hour and the secret dread of the lonely belfry and the dead. For suddenly all his thoughts are bent on a shadowy something far away, where the river widens to meet the bay, a line of black that bends and floats on the rising tide like a bridge of boats. Meanwhile, impatient to mount and ride, booted and spurred with a heavy stride, on the opposite shore walked Paul Revere. Now he patted his horse's side, now he gazed at the landscape far and near, then impetuous stamped the earth, and turned and tightened his saddle girth, but mostly he watched with eager search the belfry tower of the old north church, as it rose above the graves on the hill, lonely and spectral and somber and still, and lo, as he looks on the belfry's height, a glimmer and then a gleam of light. He springs to the saddle, the brittle he turns, but lingers and gazes till full on his sight a second lamp in the belfry burns. A hurry of hoofs in a village street, a shape in the moonlight, a bulk in the dark, and beneath from the pebbles in passing a spark struck out by a steed flying fearless and fleet. That was all, and yet through the gloom and the light the fate of a nation was riding that night and the spark struck out by that steed in his flight, kindled the land into flame with its heat. He has left the village and mounted the steep, and beneath him tranquil and broad and deep is the mystic meeting the ocean tides. And under the alders that skirt its edge, now soft on the sand, now loud on the ledge, is heard the tramp of his steed as he rides. It was twelve by the village clock when he crossed the bridge into Medford town. He heard the crowing of the cock and the barking of the farmer's dog and felt the damp of the river fog that rises after the sun goes down. It was one by the village clock when he galloped into Lexington. He saw the gilded weather cock swim in the moonlight as he passed and the meeting house windows black and bare gaze at him with a spectral glare as if they already stood aghast at the bloody work they would look upon. It was two by the village clock when he came to the bridge in Concord town. He heard the bleeding of the flock and the twitter of the birds among the trees and felt the breath of the morning breeze blowing over the meadow brown. And one was safe and asleep in his bed who at the bridge would be first to fall, who that day would be lying dead, pierced by a British musket ball. You know the rest in the books you have read how the British regulars fired and fled 
how the farmers gave them ball for ball from behind each fence and farmyard wall, chasing the redcoats down the lane, then crossing the fields to emerge again, under the trees at the turn of the road and only pausing to fire and load. So through the night rode Paul Revere, and so through the night went his cry of alarm to every Middlesex village and farm, a cry of defiance and not of fear. A voice in the darkness, a knock at the door, and a word that shall echo forevermore. For born on the night wind of the past, through all our history to the last, in the hour of darkness and peril and need, the people will waken and listen to hear the hurrying hoofbeats of that steed and the midnight message of Paul Revere. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Thank you. The Bees of Middleton Manor by May Probin. Read for LibriVox.org by Cricket. Buzzing, 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 my golden belted bees. My little son was seven years old, the mint flower touched his knees. Yellow were his curly locks, yellow were his stocking clocks. His plaything of a sword had a diamond in its hilt, where the garden beds lay sunny and the bees were making honey. For God and the King, to arms, to arms, the day long would he lilt. Smocked in lace and flowered brocade, my pretty son of seven, wept sore because the kitten died and left the charge uneven. I had one battalion, mother, Kitty, sobbed he, led the other, and when we reached the beehive bench we used to halt and storm the trench. If we could plant our standard here, with all the bees a-buzzing near, and fly the colours safe from sting, the town was taken for the king. Flitting, flitting over the time, my bees with yellow band, my little son of seven came close and clipped me by the hand. A wreath of mourning cloth was wound his small left arm and sword hilled round, and on the thatch of every hive a wisp of black was bound. Sweet mother, we must tell the bees, or they will swarm away. Ye little bees, he called, draw nigh and hark to what I say, and make us golden honey still for our white wheaten bread, though never more we rush on war with Kitty at our head. Who'll give the toast when swords are crossed, now Kitty lieth dead? Buzzing, 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 my bees of yellow girth. My son of seven changed his mood and clasped me in his mirth. Sweet mother, when I grow a man and fall on battlefield, he cried, and down in the daisied grass upon one knee he kneeled. I charge thee, come and tell the bees how I for the king lie dead, and thou shalt never lack fine honey for thy wheat and bread. Flitting, flitting, flitting. My busy bees, alas, no footstep of my soldier son came clinking through the grass. Thrice he kissed me for farewell, and far on the stone his shadow fell. He buckled spurs and sword belt on as the sun began to stoop, set foot in stirrup and sprang to horse and rode to join his troop. To the west he rode, where the winds were at play, and Monmouth's army mustering lay, where Bridgewater flew her banner high and gave up her keys when the Duke came by, and the maids of Taunton paid him court, with colours their own white hands had wrought, and red as a field where blood doth run, Sedgemoor blazed in the setting sun. Broidered sash and clasp of gold, my soldier son, alas, the mint was all in flower and the clover and the grass. With every bed in bloom, I said, what further lack the bees, that they buzz so loud like a restless cloud among the orchard trees. No voice in the air from Sedgemoor field moaned out how grey and the horse had reeled. Met me no ghost with haunting eyes that westward pointed mid its sighs and pulled apart a bloody vest and showed the sword gash in its breast. Empty hives and flitting bees and sunny morning hours. I snipped the blossomed lavender and the pinks and the jilly flowers. No petal trembled in my hold. I saw not the dead stretched stark and cold on the trampled turf at the shepherd's door, in the cloak and the doublet Monmouth wore, with Monmouth's scarf and headgear on, and the eyes, not closed, of my soldier son. 
I knew not how, ere the cocks did crow, the fight was fought in the dark, with naught for guide but the enemy's guns, when the flint flashed out a spark. Till, routed at first sound of fire, the cavalry broke and fled, and the hoofs struck dumb where they spurned the slain, and the meadow stream ran red. I saw not the handful of horsemen spur through the dusk, and out of sight, my soldier son at the duke's left hand, and grey that rode on his right. Buzzing, 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 my honey-making bees. They left the musk and the marigolds and the scented faint sweet peas. They gathered in a darkening cloud and swayed and rose to fly. A blackness on the summer blue they swept across the sky. Gaunt and ghastly with gaping wounds, my soldier son, alas, foot sore and faint, the messenger came, halting through the grass. The wind went by and shook the leaves, the mint-stalk shed its flower, and I missed the murmuring round the hives, and my boding heart beat slower. His soul we cheered with meat and wine, with women's craft and balsam fine. We bathed his hurts and bound them soft, while west the wind played through the croft, and the low sun dyed the pinks blood-red. And straying near the mint-flower shed, a wild bee wantoned o'er the bed. He told me how my son at the shepherd's door kept guard in Monmouth's clothes, while Monmouth donned the shepherd's frock in hope to cheat his foes. A couple of troopers spied him stand, and bade him yield to the king's command. Surrender, thou rebel, as good as dead, a price is set on thy traitor head. My soldier son, with secret smile, held both at bay for a little while, dealt them such death-blow as he fell, neither was left the tale to tell. With dying eyes that asked no grace, they stared on him for a minute's space, and felt that it was not Monmouth's face. Crimson, though, was Monmouth's cloak, when the soldier dropped at their side. Those knaves will carry no word, he said, and he smiled in his pain, and died. Two days, told the messenger, did we lie hid in the field of peas and rye, hid in the ditch of brake and sedge, with the enemy's scouts down every hedge, till grey was ceased, and Monmouth ceased, that under the fern did crouch, starved and haggard and all unshaved, with a few raw peas in his pouch. No music soundeth in my ears, but a passing bell that tolls, for gallant lords with head on block, sweet heaven receive their souls, and a mound unnamed in such more grass that laps my soldier's son, alas. The bloom is shed, the bees are fled, Middleton luck, it's done and dead. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Face on the Barroom Floor by Hugh Darcy Read for LibriVox.org by Michael Adams In Greeley, Colorado On September 15th, 2007 The Face on the Barroom Floor by Hugh Darcy T'was a balmy summer evening, and a goodly crowd was there, Which well-nigh filled Joe's barroom on the corner of the square. And as songs and witty stories came through the open door, A vagabond crept slowly in and posed upon the floor. "'Where did it come from?' someone said. "'The wind has blown it in.' "'What does it want?' another cried. "'Some whiskey, rum, or gin?' "'Here, Toby, sick him, if your stomach's equal to the work. "'I wouldn't touch him with a fork. He's filthy as a Turk.' This badinage the poor wretch took with stoical good grace. In face he smiled as though he thought he'd struck the proper place. Come, boys, I know there's kindly hearts among so good a crowd. To be in such good company would make a deacon proud. Give me a drink, that's what I want. I'm out of funds, you know. When I had cash to treat the gang, this hand was never slow. What? You laugh as though you thought this pocket never held a sou. I once was fixed as well, my boys, as any one of you. There, thanks. That's braced me nicely. God bless you one and all. Next time I pass this good saloon, I'll make another call. Give you a song? No, I can't do that. My singing days are past. My voice is cracked, my throat's worn out, and my lungs are going fast. I'll tell you a funny story, and a fact, I promise to. Say, 
Give me another whiskey, and I'll tell you what I'll do. That I was ever a decent man, not one of you should think. But I was, some four or five years back. Say, give me another drink. Fill her up, Joe. I want to put some life into my frame. Such little drinks to a bum like me are miserably tame. Five fingers. There, that's the scheme. And corking whiskey, too. Well, here's luck, boys, and landlord, my best regards to you. You've treated me pretty kindly, and I'd like to tell you how I came to be the dirty sot you see before you now. As I told you once, I was a man with muscle, frame, and health, and but for a blunder ought to have made considerable wealth. I was a painter, not one that daubed on bricks and wood, but an artist, and for my age was rated pretty good. I worked hard at my canvas, and was bidding fair to rise, for gradually I saw the star of fame before my eyes. I made a picture, perhaps you've seen, tis called Chase of Fame. It brought me fifteen hundred pounds and added to my name. And then I met a woman. Now comes the funny part, with eyes that petrified my brain and sunk into my heart. Why don't you laugh? Tis funny that the vagabond you see could ever love a woman and expect her love for me. But twas so, and for a month or two her smiles were freely given, and when her loving lips touched mine, it carried me to heaven. Boys, did you ever see a girl for whom your soul you'd give, with a form like the Milo Venus, too beautiful to live, with eyes that would beat the Kohinoor and a wealth of chestnut hair? If so, twas she, for there never was another half so fair. I was working on a portrait one afternoon in May of a fair-haired boy, a friend of mine, who lived across the way, and Madeline admired it, and much to my surprise said she'd like to know the man that had such dreamy eyes. It didn't take long to know him, and before the month had flown my friend had stole my darling, and I was left alone. And ere a year of misery had passed above my head, the jewel I had treasured so had tarnished and was dead. That's why I took to drink, boys. Why? I never see you smile. I thought you'd be amused and laughing all the while. Say, what's the matter, friend? There's a teardrop in your eye. Come laugh, like me. Tis only babes and women that should cry. Say, boys, if you give me just another whiskey, I'll be glad, and I'll draw right here a picture of the face that drove me mad. Give me that piece of chalk with which you mark the baseball score. You shall see the lovely Madeline upon the barroom floor. Another drink, and with chalk in hand, the vagabond began to sketch a face that might well buy the f soul of any man. Then as he placed another lock upon the shapely head, with a fearful shriek, he leaped and fell across the picture, dead. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lines, composed a few miles above Tintern Abbey, on revisiting the banks of the Wye during a tour, July 13th, 1798, by William Wordsworth. Read for LibriVox.org, by Elizabeth Clett. Five years have passed, five summers, with the length of five long winters, and again I hear these waters— rolling from their mountain springs with a soft inland murmur. Once again do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs, that on a wild secluded scene impress thoughts of a more deep seclusion, and connect the landscape with the quiet of the sky. The day is come, when I again repose here, under this dark sycamore, and view these plots of cottage ground, these orchard tufts, which at this season with their unripe fruits are clad in one green hue, and lose themselves mid groves and copses. Once again I see these hedgerows, hardly hedgerows, little lines of sportive wood run wild, these pastoral farms, green to the very door, and wreaths of smoke sent up in silence from among the trees. With some uncertain notice, as might seem of vagrant dwellers in the houseless woods, or of some hermit's cave, where by his fire the hermit sits alone. These beauteous forms, through a long absence, 
have not been to me as is a landscape to a blind man's eye. But oft, in lonely rooms, and mid the din of towns and cities, I have owed to them, in hours of weariness, sensations sweet, felt in the blood, and felt along the heart, and passing even into my purer mind, with tranquil restoration. Feelings, too, of unremembered pleasure, such, perhaps, as have no slight or trivial influence on the best portion of a good man's life, his little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love. Nor less, I trust, to them I may have owed another gift, of aspect more sublime. That blessed mood, in which the burden of the mystery, in which the heavy and the weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened, that serene and blessed mood, in which the affections gently lead us on, until the breath of this corporeal frame, and even the motion of our human blood almost suspended, we are laid asleep in body, and become a living soul, while with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony, and the deep power of joy, we see into the life of things. If this be but a vain belief, yet, oh, how oft, in darkness and amid the many shapes of joyless daylight, when the fretful stir unprofitable, and the fever of the world have hung upon the beatings of my heart, how oft in spirit have I turned to thee, O Sylvan, why? Thou wanderer through the woods, how often has my spirit turned to thee? And now, with gleams of half-extinguished thought, with many recognitions dim and faint, and somewhat of a sad perplexity, the picture of the mind revives again. While here I stand, not only with the sense of present pleasure, but with pleasing thoughts that in this moment there is life and food for future years. And so I dare to hope, though changed, no doubt, from what I was when first I came among these hills, when like a roe I bounded o'er the mountains by the sides of the deep rivers and the lonely streams, wherever nature led, more like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved. For nature then, the coarser pleasures of my boyish days and their glad animal movements all gone by, to me was all in all. I cannot paint what then I was. The sounding cataract haunted me like a passion. The tall rock, the mountain, and the deep and gloomy wood, their colours and their forms, were then to me an appetite, a feeling and a love, that had no need of a remoter charm, by thought supplied, nor any interest unborrowed from the eye. That time is past, and all its aching joys are now no more, and all its dizzy raptures. Not for this faint I, nor mourn, nor murmur. Other gifts have followed. For such loss I would believe abundant recompense. For I have learned to look on nature, not as in the hour of thoughtless youth, but hearing oftentimes the still, sad music of humanity, nor harsh, nor grating, though of ample power to chasten and subdue. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime, of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns, and the round ocean, and the living air, and the blue sky, and in the mind of man, a motion, and a spirit, that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought, and rolls through all things. Therefore am I still a lover of the meadows, and the woods, and the mountains, and of all that we behold from this green earth, of all the mighty world of eye and ear, both what they half create, and what perceive, well pleased to recognize in nature and the language of the sense, the anchor of my purest thoughts, the nurse, the guide, the guardian of my heart, and soul of all my moral being. Nor perchance, if I were not thus taught, should I the more suffer my genial spirits to decay. For thou art with me here upon the banks of this fair river. Thou, my dearest friend, my dear, dear friend, 
and in thy voice I catch the language of my former heart, and read my former pleasures in the shooting lights of thy wild eyes. O oh, yet a little while may I behold in thee what I once was, my dear, dear sister. And this prayer I make, knowing that nature never did betray the heart that loved her. Tis her privilege, through all the years of this our life, to lead from joy to joy. For she can so inform the mind that is within us, so impress with quietness and beauty, and so feed with lofty thoughts, that neither evil tongues, rash judgments, nor the sneers of selfish men, nor greetings where no kindness is, nor all the dreary intercourse of daily life, shall e'er prevail against us, or disturb our cheerful faith, that all which we behold is full of blessings. Therefore, let the moon shine on thee in thy solitary walk, and let the misty mountain winds be free to blow against thee, and in after years, when these wild ecstasies shall be matured into a sober pleasure, when thy mind shall be a mansion for all lovely forms, thy memory be as a dwelling-place for all sweet sounds and harmonies. O oh, then, if solitude, or fear, or pain, or grief should be thy portion, with what healing thoughts of tender joy will thou remember me, and these my exhortations? Nor, perchance, if I should be where I no more can hear thy voice, nor catch from thy wild eyes these gleams of past existence, Wilt thou then forget that on the banks of this delightful stream we stood together, and that I, so long a worshipper of nature, hither came unwearied in that service? Rather say with warmer love, oh, with far deeper zeal of holier love. Nor wilt thou then forget that after many wanderings, many years of absence, these steep woods and lofty cliffs, and this green pastoral landscape, were to me more dear, both for themselves and for thy sake. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Dejection, an Ode, by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Read for LibriVox.org by Elizabeth Clett. Late Late yestreen I saw the new moon, with the old moon in her arms, and I fear, I fear, my master dear, we shall have a deadly storm. Ballad of Sir Patrick Spence Well, if the bard was weather-wise who made the grand old ballad of Sir Patrick Spence, this night, so tranquil now, will not go hence unroused by winds, that ply a busier trade than those which mould yon cloud in lazy flakes, or the dull sobbing draught that moans and rakes upon the strings of this aeolian lute, which better far were mute. For lo, the new moon winter bright, and overspread with phantom light, with swimming phantom light or spread, but rimmed and circled by a silver thread, I see the old moon in her lap, foretelling the coming on of rain and squally blast. And, oh, that even now the gust were swelling, and the slant night shower driving loud and fast. Those sounds which oft have raised me, whilst they awed and sent my soul abroad, might now perhaps their wonted impulse give, might startle this dull pain, and make it move and live. A grief without a pang, void, dark, and drear, a stifled, drowsy, unimpassioned grief, which finds no natural outlet, no relief in word or sigh or tear. O oh, lady, in this wan and heartless mood, to other thoughts by yonder throstle wooed, all this long eve, so balmy and serene, have I been gazing on the western sky, and its peculiar tint of yellow-green. And still I gaze, and with how blank an eye! And those thin clouds above, in flakes and bars, that give away their motion to the stars, those stars, that glide behind them or between, now sparkling, now bedimmed, but always seen, yon crescent moon, as fixed as if it grew in its own cloudless, starless lake of blue, I see them all so excellently fair, I see, not feel, how beautiful they are. 
my genial spirits fail. And what can these avail to lift the smothering weight from off my breast? It were a vain endeavour, though I should gaze forever on that green light that lingers in the west. I may not hope from outward forms to win the passion and the life, whose fountains are within. O oh, lady, we receive but what we give, and in our life alone does nature live. Ours is her wedding garment, ours her shroud. And would we aught behold of higher worth than that inanimate cold world allowed to the poor loveless ever anxious crowd? Ah! From the soul itself must issue forth a light, a glory, a fair luminous cloud enveloping the earth. And from the soul itself must there be sent a sweet and potent voice, of its own birth, of all sweet sounds the life and element. O oh, pure of heart! Thou needst not ask of me what this strong music in the soul may be. What and wherein it doth exist, this light, this glory, this fair luminous mist, this beautiful and beauty-making power? Joy, virtuous lady, joy that ne'er was given, save to the pure, and in their purest hour, life and life's effluence, cloud at once and shower, joy, lady, is the spirit and the power which wedding nature to us gives in dower. A new earth, and new heaven, undreamt of by the sensual and the proud, joy is the sweet voice, joy the luminous cloud. We in ourselves rejoice. And thence flows all that charms or ear or sight, all melodies the echoes of that voice, all colours a suffusion from that light. There was a time, when, though my path was rough, this joy within me dallied with distress, and all misfortunes were but as the stuff whence fancy made me dreams of happiness. For hope grew round me, like the twining vine, and fruits and foliage not my own, seemed mine. But now afflictions bow me down to earth, nor care I that they rob me of my mirth. But, oh, each visitation suspends what nature gave me at my birth, my shaping spirit of imagination. For not to think of what I needs must feel, but to be still and patient all I can, and haply by abstruse research to steal from my own nature all the natural man. This was my sole resource, my only plan, till that which suits a part infects the whole, and now is almost grown the habit of my soul. Hence, viper thoughts that coil around my mind, reality's dark dream. I turn from you, and listen to the wind, which long has raved unnoticed. What a scream of agony by torture lengthened out that lute sent forth! Thou wind, that ravest without, bare crag, or mountain tarn, or blasted tree, or pine grove, whither woodmen never clomb, or lonely house long held the witch's home, Methinks were fitter instruments for thee, mad lutinist, who in this month of showers, of dark brown gardens and of peeping flowers, makest devil's yule, with worse than wintry song, the blossoms, buds, and timorous leaves among. Thou actor, perfect in all tragic sounds, thou mighty poet, even to frenzy bold, what tellst thou now about? Tis of the rushing of an host in rout with groans of trampled men, with smarting wounds, at once they groan with pain and shudder with the cold. But hush! There is a pause, of deepest silence, and all that noise is of a rushing crowd, with groans and tremulous shudderings. All is over. It tells another tale, with sounds less deep and loud, a tale of less affright, and tempered with delight as Otway's self had framed the tender lay. Tis of a little child, upon a lonesome wild, not far from home, but she hath lost her way, and now moans low in bitter grief and fear, and now screams loud, and hopes to make her mother hear. Tis midnight, but small thoughts have I of sleep, full seldom may my friend such vigils keep. Visit her, gentle sleep, with wings of healing, and may this storm be but a mountain birth, 
May all the stars hang bright above her dwelling, Silent as though they watched the sleeping earth. With light heart may she rise, Gay fancy, cheerful eyes. Joy lift her spirit, joy attune her voice. To her may all things live from pole to pole, Their life the eddying of her living soul. O simple spirit, guided from above, Dear lady, friend devoutest of my choice, Thus mayst thou ever, evermore rejoice. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Kitten and Falling Leaves by William Wordsworth Read for LibriVox.org by Carolyn Francis that way look, my infant, lo! What a pretty baby show! See the kitten on the wall, Sporting with the leaves that fall, Withered leaves, one, two, and three, From the lofty elder tree. Through the calm and frosty air Of this morning bright and fair, Eddying round and round they sink Softly, slowly, one might think, from the motions that are made, Every little leaf conveyed sylph or fairy, Hither tending, to this lower world descending, Each invisible and mute, in his wavering parachute. But the kitten, how she starts, crouches, stretches, paws, and darts, First at one, and then its fellow, Just as light and just as yellow, there are many now, now one. Now they stop and there are none. What intenseness of desire in her upward eye of fire! With a tiger leap, half way now she meets the coming prey, lets it go as fast, and then has it in her power again. Now she works with three or four, like an Indian conjurer, quick as he in feats of art far beyond in joy of heart. Were her antics played in the eye of a thousand standers by, clapping hands with shout and stare, what would little Tabby care for the plaudits of the crowd? Over happy to be proud, over wealthy in the treasure of her own exceeding pleasure. Tis a pretty baby treat nor I deem for me unmeet. Here, for neither babe nor me, other playmate can I see. Of the countless living things that with stir of feet and wings, in the sun or under shade, upon bough or grassy blade, and with busy revelings, chirp and song and murmurings, made this orchard's narrow space and this vale so blith a place, Multitudes are swept away never more to breathe the day. Some are sleeping. Some in bands traveled into distant lands. Others slunk to moor and wood far from human neighborhood. And among the kinds that keep with us closer fellowship, with us openly abide, all have laid their mirth aside. Where is he, that giddy sprite, Blue cap with his colors bright, Who was blessed as bird could be Feeding in the apple tree, Made such wanton spoil and rout, Turning blossoms inside out, Hung, head pointing towards the ground, Fluttered, perched, into a round Bound himself and then unbound, Lithest, gaudiest harlequin, Prettiest tumbler ever seen, Light of heart, and light of limb, what is now become of him? Lambs that through the mountains went frisking, bleeding merriment, when the year was in its prime, they are sobered by this time. If you look to vale or hill, if you listen, all is still, save a little neighboring rill that from out the rocky ground strikes a solitary sound. Vainly, Glitter hill and plain, and the air is calm in vain. 
Vainly morning spreads the lure Of a sky serene and pure. Creature none can she decoy Into open sign of joy. Is it that they have a fear Of the dreary season near? Or that other pleasures be sweeter Even than gaiety? Yet, whate'er enjoyments dwell In the impenetrable cell Of the silent heart Which nature furnishes to every creature, Whatsoe'er we feel and know Too sedate for outward show, Such a light of gladness breaks, Pretty kitten, from thy frakes, Spreads with such a living grace O'er my little Dora's face. Yes, the sight so stirs and charms thee, baby, Laughing in my arms, That almost I could repine That your transports are not mine, That I do not wholly fare, Even as ye do, thoughtless pair. And I will have my careless season, Spite of melancholy reason, will walk through life in such a way that, when time brings on decay, now and then I may possess hours of perfect gladsomeness, pleased by any random toy, by a kitten's busy joy, or an infant's laughing eye sharing in the ecstasy. I would fare like that or this, find my wisdom in my bliss. Keep the sprightly soul awake, And have faculties to take, Even from things by sorrow wrought, Matter for a jocund thought, Spite of care and spite of grief, To gamble with life's falling leaf. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Hound of Heaven by Francis Thompson. Read for LibriVox.org by Adam Ringa. The Hound of Heaven. I fled him, down the nights and down the days. I fled him, down the arches of the years. I fled him, down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the midst of tears I hid from him, and under running laughter. Up vistaed hopes I sped, and shot precipitated a down titanic glooms of chasmed fears from those strong feet that followed, followed after. But with unhurrying chase, an unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, they beat, and a voice beat, more instant than the feet. All things betray thee, who betrayest me? I pleaded, outlaw-wise, by many a hearted casement, curtained red, trellised with intertwining charities. For, though I knew his love who followed, yet was I sore adread, lest having him I must have naught beside. But, if one little casement parted wide, the gust of his approach would clash it too. Fear wist not to evade, as love wist to pursue. Across the margin of the world I fled, And troubled the gold gateways of the stars, Smiting for shelter on their clanged bars, Fretted to dulcet jars and silvern chatter The pale ports of the moon. I said to dawn, Be sudden, to eve, be soon, With thy young sky blossoms heap me over From this tremendous lover. Float thy vague veil about me, lest he see. I tempted all his servitors, but to find my own betrayal in their constancy, in faith to him, their fickleness to me, their traitorous trueness, and their loyal deceit. To all swift things, for swiftness did I sue, clung to the whistling mane of every wind. But whether they swept, smoothly fleet, the long savannas of the blue, or whether, thunder-driven, they clanged his chariot thwart a heaven, plashy with flying lightnings round the spurns of their feet. Fear wist not to evade, as love wist to pursue. Still, with unhurrying chase, and unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, came on the following feet, and a voice above their beat. 
Naught shelters thee, who wilt not shelter me. I sought no more that after which I strayed, in fa face of man or maid. But still, within the little children's eyes, seems something, something that replies, They at least are for me, surely for me. I turned me to them very wistfully. But just as their young eyes grew sudden fair with dawning answers there, their angel plucked them from me by the hair. Come then, ye other children, natures, share with me, said I, your delicate fellowship. Let me greet you lip to lip, let me twine with you caresses, wantoning with our lady mother's vagrant tresses, banqueting with her in her wa wind-walled palace, underneath her azure dais, quaffing, as your taintless way is, from a chalice, lucent weeping out of the day-spring. So it was done. I, in their delicate fellowship, was one, drew the bolt of nature's secrecies. I knew all the swift importings on the willful face of skies. I knew how the clouds arise, spumant of the wild sea-snortings. All that's born or dies, rose and drooped with, made the shapers of mine own moods, or wailful, or divine. With them joyed and was bereaven. I was heavy with the even, when she lit her glimmering tapers round the day's dead sanctities. I laughed in the morning's eyes. I triumphed and I saddened with all weather. Heaven and I wept together, and its sweet tears were salt with mortal mine. Against the red throb of its sunset heart, I laid my own to beat, and share commingling heat. But not by that, by that, was eased my human smart. In vain my tears were wet on heaven's gray cheek. For ah, we know not what each other says, these things and I. In sound I speak, their sound is but their stir, they speak by silences. Nature, poor stepdame, cannot slake my drouth. Let her, if she would owe me, drop yon blue bosom veil of sky and show me the breasts of her tenderness. Never did any milk of hers once bless my thirsting mouth. Nigh and nigh draws the chase, with unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy. And past those noised feet, a voice comes yet more fleet. Lo, naught contents thee, who contentst not me? Naked, I wait thy love's uplifted stroke. My harness, piece by piece, thou hast hewn from me, and smitten me to my knee. I am defenseless utterly. I slept, methinks, and woke, and slowly gazing, find me stripped in sleep. In the rash, lusty head of my young powers, I shook the pillaring hours, and pulled my life upon me. Grimed with smears, I stand amid the dust of the mounded years. My mangled youth lies dead beneath the heap. My days have crackled and gone up in smoke, have puffed and burst as sun starts on a stream. Yea, faileth now even dream the dreamer and the lute the ludinist. Even the linked fantasies, in whose blossomy twist I swung the earth a trinket at my wrist, are yielding. Chords of all too weak account for earth with heavy griefs so overplussed. Ah, is thy love indeed a weed, albeit an amaranthine weed, suffering no flowers except its own to mount? Ah, must, design or infinite. Ah, must thou char the wood ere thou canst limb with it? My freshness spent its wavering shower in the dust. And now my heart is as a broken fount, wherein tear-drippings stagnate, spilt down ever 
from the dank thoughts that shiver upon the sighful branches of my mind. Such is. What is to be? The pulp's so bitter. How shall taste the rind? I dimly guess what time in mists confounds. Yet ever and anon, a trumpet sounds from the hid battlements of eternity. Those shaken mists a space unsettle, then round the half-glimpsed turrets slowly wash again. But not ere him who summoneth I first have seen, and wound with glooming robes purpureal, cypress crowned. His name I know, and what his trumpet saith whether man's heart or life it be which yields thee harvest, must thy harvest fields be dunged with rotten death. Now of that long pursuit comes at hand the brute. That voice is round me like a bursting sea. And is thy earth so marred, shattered in shard on shard? Lo, all things fly thee, for thou fliest me. Strange! piteous, futile thing. Wherefore should any set thee love apart? Seeing none but I make much of naught, he said. And human love needs human meriting. How hast thou merited? Of all man's clotted clay, the dingiest clot. Alack, thou knowest not how little worthy of any love thou art. Whom wilt thou find to love ignoble thee? Save me save only me. All which I took from thee, I did but take not for thy harms, but just that thou might seek it in my arms. All which thy child's mistake fancies as lost, I have stored for thee at home. Rise, clasp my hand, and come. Halts by me that footfall. Is my gloom after all, shade of his hand outstretched caressingly? Ah, fondest, blindest, weakest, I am he whom thou seekest. Thou dravest love from thee who dravest me. End of the Hound of Heaven Recording by Adam Ringeth This recording is in the public domain. Wild Grapes by Robert Frost Read for LibriVox.org by Carolyn Francis What tree may not the fig be gathered from? The grape may not be gathered from the birch? It's all you know the grape, or know the birch. As a girl gathered from the birch myself equally with my waiting grapes one autumn, I ought to know what tree the grape is fruit of. I was born, I suppose, like any one, and grew to be a little boyish girl my brother could not always leave at home. But that beginning was wiped out in fear the day I swung suspended with the grapes, and was come after like Eurydice and brought down safely from the upper regions. And the life I live now is an extra life I can waste as I please on whom I please. So if you see me celebrate two birthdays, and give myself out of two different ages, one of them five years younger than I look, one day my brother led me to a glade where a white birch he knew of stood alone, wearing a thin headdress of pointed leaves and heavy on her heavy hair behind, against her neck, an ornament of grapes. Grapes! I knew grapes from having seen them last year. One bunch of them, and there began to be bunches all around me growing in white birches, the way they grew round leaf the luckiest German. Mostly as much beyond my lifted hands, though, as the moon used to seem when I was younger, and only freely to be had for climbing. My brother did the climbing, and at first threw me down grapes to miss and scatter and have to hunt for, in sweet fern and hard hack, which gave him some time to himself to eat, but not so much, perhaps, as a boy needed. So then, to make me wholly self-supporting, he climbed still higher and bent the tree to earth, and put it in my hands to pick my own grapes. Here, take a tree top. I'll get down another. Hold on with all your might when I let go. I said I had the tree. It wasn't true. 
The opposite was true. The tree had me. The minute it was left with me alone, it caught me up as if I were the fish, and it the fish pole. So I was translated to loud cries from my brother of, Let go! Don't you know anything, you girl? Let go! But I, with something of the baby grip acquired ancestrally in just such trees, when wilder mothers than our wildest now hung babies out on branches by the hands to dry, or wash, or tan, I don't know which. You'll have to ask an evolutionist. I held on uncomplainingly for life. My brother tried to make me laugh to help me. What are you doing up there in those grapes? Don't be afraid. A few of them won't hurt you. I mean, they won't pick you if you don't them. Much danger of my picking anything. By that time I was pretty well reduced to a philosophy of hang and let hang. Now you know how it feels, my brother said, to be a bunch of fox grapes, as they call them, that when it thinks it has escaped the fox by growing where it shouldn't, on a birch, where the fox wouldn't think to look for it, and if he looked and found it, couldn't reach it, just then come you and I to gather it. Only you have the advantage of the grapes in one way, you have more stem to cling by, and promise more resistance to the picker. One by one, I lost off my hat and shoes, and still I clung. I let my head fall back and shut my eyes against the sun, my ears against my brother's nonsense. Drop, he said. I'll catch you in my arms. It isn't far. Stated in lengths of him it might not be. Drop, or I'll shake the tree and shake you down. Grim silence on my part as I sank lower, my small wrists stretching till they showed the banjo strings. Why, if she isn't serious about it, hold tight a while till I think what to do. I'll bend the tree down and let you down by it. I don't know much about the letting down. But once I felt ground with my stocking feet and the world came revolving back to me, I know I looked long at my curled-up fingers before I straightened them and brushed the bark off. My brother said, don't you weigh anything? Try to weigh something next time so you won't be run off with by birch trees into space. It wasn't my not weighing anything so much as my not knowing anything. My brother had been nearer right before. I had not taken the first step in knowledge. I had not learned to let go with the hands, as still I have not learned to with the heart, and have no wish to with the heart nor need that I can see. The mind is not the heart. I may yet live, as I know others live, to wish in vain to let go with the mind, of cares at night to sleep, but nothing tells me that I need learn to let go with the heart. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Singing Man by Josephine Preston Peabody Read for LibriVox.org by Peter Yearsley The Singing Man Part 1 He sang above the vineyards of the world, and after him the vines with woven hands clambered and clung, and everywhere unfurled triumphing green above the barren lands. Till high as gardens grow he climbed, he stood, sun-crowned with life and strength and singing toil and looked upon his work and it was good the corn the wine the oil he sang above the noon the topmost cleft that grudged him footing on the mountain scars he planted and despaired not till he left his vines soft breathing to the host of stars he wrought he tilled and even as he sang the creatures of his planting laughed to scorn the ancient threat of deserts where there sprang the wine the oil the corn he sang not for abundance overlords took of his tilth yet was there still to reap the portion of his labour dear rewards of sunlit day and bread and human sleep he sang for strength for glory of the light he dreamed above the furrows, they are mine, 
when all he wrought stood fair before his sight, with corn and oil and wine. Truly the light is sweet, yea, and a pleasant thing it is to see the sun, and that a man should eat his bread that he hath won, so it is sung and said, that he should take and keep after his labouring the portion of his labour in his bread, his bread that he hath won, yea, and in quiet sleep when all is done. He sang above the burden and the heat, above all seasons with their fitful grace, above the chance and change that led his feet to this last ambush of the market-place. Enough for him, they said, and still they say, a crust with air to breathe and sun to shine, he asks no more, before they took away the corn, the oil, the wine. He sang. No more he sings now anywhere. Light was enough before he was undone. They knew it well who took away the air, who took away the sun, who took to serve their soul-devouring greed, himself, his breath, his bread, the goad of toil, who have and hold before the eyes of need the corn, the wine, the oil. Truly one thing is sweet of things beneath the sun, this that a man should earn his bread and eat, rejoicing in his work which he hath done. What shall be sung or said of desolate deceit, when others take his bread, his and his children's bread, and the labourer hath none? This, for his portion now, of all that he hath done, he earns, and others eat. He starves, they sit at meat, who have taken away the sun. Part two. Seek for him now, that singing man. Look for him, look for him in the mills, in the mines, where the very daylight pines. He who once did walk the hills, you shall find him if you scan shapes all unbefitting man, bodies warped and faces dim in the mines, in the mills, where the ceaseless thunder fills spaces of the human brain, till all thought is turned to pain, where the skirl of wheel on wheel, grinding him who is their tool, makes the shattered senses reel to the numbness of the fool. Perished thought and halting tongue, once it spoke, once it sung, lived to hunger, dead to song. Only heartbeats, loud with wrong, hammer on. How long, how long, how long? Search for him, search for him, where the crazy atoms swim up the fiery furnace blast. You shall find him at the last, he whose forehead braved the sun, wrecked and tortured and undone, where no breath across the heat whispers him that life was sweet, but the sparkles mock and flare, scattering up the crooked air, blackened with that bitter murk. Would God know his handiwork? Thought is not for such as he, naught but strength and misery, since for just the bite and sup life must needs be swallowed up. Only reeling up the sky, hurtling flames that hurry by, gasp and flare with, Why, why, why? Why the human mind of him shrinks and falters and is dim, when he tries to make it out what the torture is about? Why he breathes, a fugitive whom the world forbids to live? Why he earned for his abode habitation of the toad? Why his fevered day by day will not serve to drive away horror that must always haunt? Want, want! Nightmare shot with waking pangs, Tightening coil and certain fangs, close and closer, always nigh. Why? Why? Why he labours under ban that denies him for a man? Why his utmost drop of blood buys for him no human good? Why his utmost urge of strength only lets them starve at length? Will not let him starve alone, he must watch and see his own fade and fail and starve and die. Why, why? Heartbeats in a hammering song heavy as an ox may plod, goaded, goaded, faint with wrong, cry unto some ghost of God, How long, 
How long? How long? Part three. Seek him yet, search for him. You shall find him spent and grim in the prisons where we pen these unsightly shards of men. Sheltered fast, housed at length, clothed and fed, no matter how. Where the householders aghast measure in his broken strength, naught but power for evil now. Beast of burden, drudgeries, could not earn him what was his. He who heard the world applaud glories seized by force and fraud, he must break, he must take, both for hate and hunger's sake. He must seize by fraud and force, he must strike without remorse, seize he might, but never keep. Strike his once, behold him here, human life we buy so cheap, who should know we held it dear? No denial, no defence, from a brain bereft of sense, any more than penitence. But the heart beats, now, that plod goaded, goaded, dumb with wrong, ask not even a ghost of God, how long? When the sea gives up its dead, prison caverns yield instead this rejected and despised, this the soiled and sacrificed. Without form or comeliness, shamed for us that did transgress, bruised for our iniquities, with the stripes that are all his, face that wreckage you who can, it was once the singing man. Part 4. Must it be? Must we then render back to God again this his broken work, this thing for his man that once did sing? Will not all our wonders do, gifts we stored the ages through, trusting that he had forgot, gifts the Lord required not? Would the all but human serve, monsters made of stone and nerve, towers to threaten and defy, curse or blessing of the sky, shafts that blot the stars with smoke, Lightnings harnessed under yoke, sea things, air things, wrought with steel that may smite and fly and feel, oceans calling each to each, hostile hearts with kindred speech, every work that titans can, every marvel, save a man who might rule without a sword. Is a man more precious, Lord? Can it be? Must we then render back to thee again million, million wasted men, men of flickering human breath, only made for life and death? Ah, but see the sovereign few, highly favoured that remain, these the glorious residue of the cherished race of Cain, these the magnates of the age, high above the human wage, who have numbered and possessed all the portion of the rest. What are all despairs and shames? What the mean forgotten names of the thousand more or less, For one surfeit of success? For those dullest lives we spent, Take these few magnificent, For that host of blotted ones, Take these glittering central suns, Few, but how their lustre thrives On the million broken lives, Splendid over dark and doubt, For a million souls gone out, These, the holders of our hoard, wilt thou not accept them, Lord? Part five. O, oh, in the wakening thunders of the heart, the small lost Eden, troubled through the night, sounds there not now, foreboded and apart, some voice and sword of light, some voice and portent of a dawn to break, searching like God, the ruinous human shard of that lost brother man himself did make, and man himself hath marred. It sounds, and may the anguish of that birth seize on the world, and may all shelters fail, till we behold new heaven and new earth through the rent temple veil. When the high tides that threaten near and far to sweep away our guilt before the sky, flooding the waste of this dishonoured star, cleanse and overwhelm and cry, Cry from the deep of world-accusing waves With longing more than all since light began, Above the nations, underneath the graves, Give back the singing man! End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Mary Gloucester by Rudyard Kipling
Read for LibriVox by Andy Minter. I've paid for your sickest fancies, I've humoured your cracktest whim. Dick, it's your daddy dying, you've got to listen to him. Good for a fortnight, am I? The doctor told you? He lied. I shall go under my mourning. And put that nurse outside. Never seen death yet, Dicky. Well, now's your time to learn. And you'll wish you held my record before it comes to your turn. Not counting the line and the foundry, the yards and the village, too. I've made myself and a million, but I'm damned if I made you. Master at two and twenty, and married at twenty-three. Ten thousand men on the payroll, and forty freighters at sea. Fifty years between them, and every year of it fight. And now I'm Sir Anthony Gloucester, dying, a baronite. For I lunched with his royal highness. What was it the papers had? Not least of our merchant princes. <laughs> Dicky, that's me, your dad. I didn't begin with askings. I took my job and I stuck. I took the chances they wouldn't. And now they're calling it luck. Lord, what boats I've handled. Rotten and leaky and old. Ran em. Or opened a bilgecock. Precisely as I was told. Grub that had bind you crazy, and crews that had turn you grey, and a big fat lump of insurance to cover the risk on the way. The others they durstn't do it. They said they valued their life. They've served me since as skippers. I went, and I took my wife. Over the world I drove 'em, married at twenty-three, and your mother saving the money and making a man of me. I was content to be master, but she said there was better behind. She took the chances I wouldn't, and I followed your mother blind. She egged me to borrow the money, and she helped me to clear the loan when we bought half shares in the cheapen and hoisted a flag of our own, patching and coaling on credit, and living the Lord knew how. We started the Red Ox freighters. We've eight and thirty now. And those were the days of the clippers, and the freights were clipper freights, and we knew we were making our fortune. But she died in Macassar Straits. By the little paternosters, as we come to the Union Bank, and we dropped her in fourteen fathom, I pricked it off where she sank. Owners we were, full owners, and the boat was christened to her, and she died in the Mary Gloucester. My heart, how young we were! So I went on a spree round Java, and well nigh ran her ashore. But your mother came and warned me, and I wouldn't lick her no more. Strict, I stuck to me business, afraid to stop or I'd think. Saving the money, she warned me, and letting the other men drink. And I met McCulloch in London. I'd saved five hundred then, and tween us we started the foundry, three forges and twenty men. Cheap repairs for the cheapen, it paid, and the business grew, for I bought me a steam lathe patent, and that was a gold mine too. Cheaper to build them than buy them, I said, but McCulloch he shied, and we wasted a year in talking before we moved to the Clyde, and the lines were all beginning and we all of us started fair, building our engines like houses, and staying the boilers square. But McCulloch, he wanted cabins with marble and maple and all, and Brussels and Utrecht velvet, and baths and a social hall, and pipes for closets all over, and cutting the frames too light. But McCulloch, he died in the sixties, and, well, I'm dying tonight. I knew, I knew what was coming when we bid on the Byfleet's keel. They piddled and piffled with iron. I'd given my orders for steel. Steel and the first expansions. It paid, I tell you, it paid, when we came with our nine-knot freighters and collared the long-run trade. And they asked me how I did it, and I gave them the scripture text. You keep your light so shining, a little in front of the next. 
They copied all they could follow, but they couldn't copy my mind. And I left them sweating and stealing, a year and a half behind. Then came the armour contracts, but that was McCulloch's side. He was always best in the foundry, but better, perhaps, he died. I went through his private papers. The notes was plainer than print. Now, I'm no fool to finish, if a man'll give me a hint. I remember his widow was angry. So I saw what his drawings meant, and I started the six-inch rollers, and it paid me sixty per cent. Sixty per cent with failures, and more than twice we could do, and a quarter million to credit. But I saved it all for you. I thought, it doesn't matter. You seem to favour your ma. You're nearer forty than thirty, and I know the kind you are. Arrow and Trinity College, I ought to have sent you to sea. But I stood you an education. And what have you done for me? The things I knew was proper, you wouldn't thank me to give. And the things I knew was rotten, you said was the way to live. For you're muddled with books and pictures and china and etchings and pans. And your rooms at college was beastly. More like a horse than a man's. Till you married that thin-flanked woman, as white and stale as a bone. And she gave you your social nonsense. But where's that kid of your own? I've seen your carriages blocking the half of the Cromwell Road. But never the doctor's brougham to help the missus unload. So there isn't even a grandchild. And the Gloucester family's done. Not like your mother, she isn't. She carried her freight each run, but they died, the poor little beggars. At sea she had them. They died. Only you, and you stood it. You haven't stood much beside. Weak, a liar, and idle, and mean as a collier's whelp. Nosing for scraps in the galley. No help. My son was no help. So he gets three hundred thousand in trust, and the interest paid. I wouldn't give it, you dicky, you see. I made it in trade. You're saved from soiling your fingers, and if you have no child, it all comes back to the business. Yeah, won't your wife be wild? Calls and calls in her carriage, her handkerchief up to her eye. Daddy, dear, daddy's dying, and doing her best to cry. Grateful? Oh, yes, I'm grateful, but keep her away from here. Your mother had never have stood her, and anyhow, women are queer. There's women'll say I've married a second time, not quite. But give poor Aggie a hundred, and tell her your lawyers'll fight. She was the best of the boiling. You'll meet her before it ends. I'm in for a row with the mother. I'll leave you to settle, my friends. For a man he must go with a woman, which women don't understand or the sort they say they can see it, if they aren't the marrying brand. But I wanted to speak of your mother. That's Lady Gloucester still. I'm going to up and see her, without its hurting the will. Here, take your hand off the bell, pull. Five thousand's waiting for you. If you'll only listen a minute, and do as I bid you do, they'll try to prove me crazy. And if you bungle, they can... I've only you to trust to. Oh, God, why ain't it a man? There's some waste money on marbles, the same as McCulloch tried. Marbles and mausoleums, but I call that sinful pride. There's some ship bodies for burial. We've carried them, soldered and packed. Down in their wills they wrote it, and nobody called them cracked. But me, I've too much money, and people might... All my fault. It comes to open for grandsons and buying that woking vault. I'm sick of the old damn business. I'm going back where I came. Dick, you're the son of my body, and you'll take charge of the same. I want to lie by your mother, ten thousand mile away. And they'll want to send me to woking, and that's where you'll earn your pay. I've thought it out on the quiet, the same as it ought to be done. "'Quiet and decent and proper. "'And here's your orders, my son. "'You know the line. "'You don't, though. "'You write to the board and tell. "'Your father's death has upset you, "'and you're going to cruise for a spell. 
"'And you'd like the Mary Gloucester. "'I've held her ready for this. "'They'll put her in working order, "'and you'll take her out as she is. "'Yes, it was money idle when I patched her and laid her aside. "'Thank God I can pay for me fancies. "'A boat where your mother died. "'By the little paternosters, as you come to the Union Bank. "'We dropped her, I think I told you, "'and I pricked it off where she sank.' Tiny she looked on the grating, that oily, treacly sea. Hundred and eighteen east, remember, and south, just three. Easy bearings to carry. Three south, three to the dot. But I gave MacAndrew a copy in case of dying or not. So you'll write to MacAndrew. He's chief of the Maori line. They'll give him leave, if you ask them, and say it's business of mine. I built three boats for the Maoris, and very well pleased they were. And I have known Mac since the fifties, and Mac knew me, and her. After the first stroke warned me, I sent him the money to keep, against the time you'd claim it, committing your dad to the deep. For you were the son of my body, and Mac was my oldest friend. I've never asked him to dinner, but he'll see it out to the end. "'Stiff-necked Glasgow beggar. "'I've heard he's prayed for my soul. "'But he couldn't lie if you paid him, "'and he'd starve before he stole. "'You'll take the Mary in ballast. "'You'll find her a lively ship. "'And you'll take Sir Anthony Gloucester "'that goes on his wedding trip. "'Lashed in our old deck cabin, "'with all three portholes wide, "'the kick of the screw beneath him "'and the round blue seas outside.' Sir Anthony Gloucester's carriage, our house flag flying free. Ten thousand men on the payroll and forty freighters at sea. He made himself and a million, but this world is a fleeting show, and he'll go to the wife of his bosom the same as he ought to go. By the heel of the paternosters, there isn't a chance to mistake, and Mac'll pay you the money as soon as the bubbles break. Five thousand for six weeks cruising, the staunchest freighter afloat. And, Mac, he'll give you your bonus the minute I'm out of the boat. He'll take you round to Macassar, and you'll come back alone. He knows what I want of the Mary. I'll do what I please with my own. Your mother had called it wasteful, but I've seven and thirty more. I'll come in my private carriage and bid it wait at the door. For my son he was never a credit. He muddled with books and art. And he lived on Sir Anthony's money. And he broke Sir Anthony's art. There isn't even a grandchild. And a Gloucester family's done. The only one you left me. Ah, oh, mother, the only one. Arran and Trinity College. Me slaving early and late. And he thinks I'm dying crazy. And you're in Macassar Strait. "'Flesh of my flesh, my dearie, for ever and ever, amen. "'That first stroke come for a warning. "'I ought to have gone to you then. "'But cheap repairs for a cheap, and the doctors said I'd do. "'Mary, why didn't you warn me? "'I always eated to you, except, I know, about women, "'but you were a spirit now. "'And wife, they was only women, and I was a man, that's how.' And a man he must go with a woman, as you could not understand. Though I never talked em secret, I paid em out of hand. Thank God I can pay for my fancies. Now what's five thousand to me, for a berth off the paternosters, in Avon, where I would be? I believe in the resurrection, if I read my Bible plain. But I wouldn't trust em at Woking, we're safer at sea again. For the heart it shall go with the treasure, go down to the sea in ships. I'm sick of the hired women, and I'll kiss my girl on her lips. I'll be content with my fountain, and I'll drink from my own well, and the wife of my youth shall charm me, and the rest can go to hell. Dicky, he will, that's certain. I'll lie in our standing bed. And Mac'll take her in ballast, and she trims best by the head. 
down by the head and sinking her fires are drawn and cold, and the water splashing hollow on the skin of the empty hold, churning and choking and chuckling, quiet and scummy and dark, fall to her lower hatches and rise in steady, hark. That was the after bulkhead. She's flooded from stem to stern. Never seen death yet, Dicky. Well, now is the time to learn. End of poem. The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. Read for LibriVox.org by Julie Coker. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember, it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow, from my book's surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore. For the rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here for evermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain, rustling of each purple curtain, thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. So that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. That it is, and nothing more. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning. Soon again I heard a tapping, somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see, then, what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, then, with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not an instant stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord and lady, perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art shirt no craven. Ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore, tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, Though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore, for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such a name as Nevermore. 
But the raven, sitting lonely on that placid bust, spoke only. That one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing further than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, Nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken, by reply so aptly spoken, Doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store. Caught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster, till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope the melancholy burden bore, of never, never more. But the raven, still beguiling all my sad soul into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking, fancy unto fancy, thinking, what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore, meant in croaking, nevermore. This I sat, engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing, to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining, on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er, but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er, she shall press, ah, nevermore. Then, methought, the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he hath sent thee, respite, respite, and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff this kind nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still of bird or devil, whether tempter sent or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, Desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still of bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore. Tell the soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden, it shall clasp a saintly maiden, whom the angels name Lenore. Clasp a rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels name Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked upstarting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, Still is sitting, still is sitting, on the pallid bust of Pallas, just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Ulysses by Alfred Lord Tennyson It little profits that an idle king, by this still hearth, among these barren crags, matched with an aged wife, I meet and dole unequal laws unto a savage race, that hoard, and sleep, and feed, and know not me. I cannot rest from travel, I will drink life to the lees. All times I have enjoyed greatly, have suffered greatly, both with those that loved me and alone on shore, and when through scudding drifts the rainy Hyades vexed the dim sea. I am become a name, for always roaming with a hungry heart much have I seen and known, cities of men and manners, climates, councils, governments, myself not least, but honoured of them all and drunk delight of battle with my peers far on the ringing plains of windy Troy. I am a part of all that I have met, yet all experience is an arch wherethrough gleams that untravelled world whose margin fades forever and forever when I move. How dull it is to pause, to make an end, to rust unburnished, not to shine, in use as though to breathe were life. Life piled on life were all too little, and of one to me. Little remains, but every hour is saved from that eternal silence, something more, a bringer of new things, and vile it were for some three sons to store and hoard myself, and this gray spirit yearning in desire to follow knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bound of human thought. This is my son, mine own Telemachus, to whom I leave the scepter and the isle, well loved of me, discerning to fulfill this labor by slow prudence to make mild a rugged people, and through soft degrees subdue them to the useful and the good. Most blameless is he, centred in the sphere of common duties, decent not to fail in offices of tenderness, and pay meet adoration to my household gods when I am gone. He works his work, I mine. There lies the port, the vessel puffs her sail, there gloom the dark broad seas, my mariners, souls that have toiled and wrought and thought with me that ever with a frolic welcome took the thunder and the sunshine and opposed free hearts free foreheads you and i are old old age hath yet his honour and his toil death closes all but something ere the end some work of noble note may yet be done not unbecoming men that strove with gods. The lights begin to twinkle from the rocks. The long day wanes, the slow moon climbs, the deep moans round with many voices. Come, my friends, tis not too late to seek a newer world. Push off, and sitting well in order smite the sounding furrows, for my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western stars until I die. It may be that the gulfs will wash us down. It may be that we shall touch the happy isles and see the great Achilles whom we knew. Though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Drake Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. "'Only this, and nothing more.' "'Ah, distinctly I remember, it was in the bleak December, "'and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. "'Eagerly I wished the morrow. "'Vainly I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow.' sorrow for the lost lenore but a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named lenore nameless here for evermore and the silken sad uncertain rustling of each purple coiton trilled me filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before so that now to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, There tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more. Presently my heart grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, Truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is, I was napping, And so gently you came rapping, And so faintly you came tapping, Tapping at my chamber door, That I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door, Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into the darkness peering, Long I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the darkness gave no token, and the only void there spoken was the whispered void, Lenore. Thus I whispered, and an echo murmured back the void, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber toining all my soul within me boining. Soon again I heard a tapping somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when, with many a floyt and flutter, and there stepped the stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not an instant stopped or stayed he, but, with mien of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony boy, beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore, Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven. Ghastly grim and ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore, 
Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore. Quote the raven, nevermore. Much I marvel this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little revelancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast above the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such a name as Nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bust, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word did he outpour. Nothing foited then he uttered, not a feather then he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, Other friends have flown before, on a morrow will he leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the boy said, Nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, Doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store. Caught from some unhappy master whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of never, never more. But the raven, still beguiling all my sad soul into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of Boyd and bust and door. Then, upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to Lincoln, fancy and to fancy, thinking what this ominous Boyd of yore, what this grim, ungainly, gaunt and ominous Boyd of yore meant in croaking nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl, whose fiery eyes now boined into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet-violet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er. But, whose velvet-violet lining, with the lamp-like gloating o'er, she shall press, ah, uh, nevermore. Then me taught the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer swung by angels, whose faint footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch! I cried, thy God at lent thee, by these angels he had sent thee respite, Respite and empathy from the memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh, quaff this kind nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Quote the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if boyd or devil, whether tempter sent, or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted. Tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quote the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if boy or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a saintly maiden whom the angels named Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named Lenore, Quote the raven, nevermore. Be that void, our sign of pardon, bird or fiend, I shrieked up starting, 
Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust upon my door. Take thy beak from out my heart, and take thy form from off my door. Quote the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas, just above my chamber door. And his eyes, have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. End the poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song of Myself by Walt Whitman Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake the pure contralto sings in the organ loft. The carpenter dresses his plank. The tongue of his foreplane whistles its wild ascending lisp. The married and unmarried children ride home to their Thanksgiving dinner. The pilot seizes the kingpin. He heaves down with a strong arm. The mate stands braced in the whaleboat. Lance and harpoon are ready. The duck shooter walks by, silent and cautious stretches. The deacons are ordained with crossed hands at the altar. The spinning girl retreats and advances to the hum of the big wheel. The farmer stops by the bars as he walks on a Friday loaf and looks at the oats and rye. The lunatic is carried at last to the asylum, a confirmed case. He will never sleep any more as he did in the cot in his mother's bedroom. The juror printer with gray head and gaunt jaws works at his case. He turns his quid of tobacco while his eyes blur with the manuscript. The malformed limbs are tied to the surgeon's table. What is removed drops horribly in a pail. The quadroon girl is sold at the auction stand. The drunkard nods by the barroom stove. The machinist rolls up his sleeves. The policeman travels his beat. The gatekeeper marks who pass. The young fellow drives the express wagon. I love him, though I do not know him. The half-breed straps on his light boots to compete in the race. The western turkey shooting draws old and young. Some lean on their rifles, some sit on logs. Out from the crowds steps the marksman, takes his position, levels his piece. The groups of new-come immigrants cover the wharf or levee. As the woolly pates hoe in the sugar field, the overseer views them from his saddle. The bugle calls in the ballroom, the gentlemen run for their partners, the dancers bow to each other. The youth lies awake in the cedar-roofed garret and harks to the musical rain. The wolverine sets traps on the creek that helps fill the Huron. The squaw, wrapped in her yellow-hemmed cloth, is offering moccasins and bead bags for sale. The connoisseur peers along the exhibition gallery, with half-shut eyes bent sideways. As the deckhands make fast the steamboat, the plank is thrown for the shore-going passengers. The young sister holds out the skein, while the elder sister winds it off in a ball, and stops now and then for the knots. 
the one-year wife is recovering and happy having a week ago born her first child the clean-haired yankee girl works with her sewing machine or in the factory or mill the paving man leans on his two-handed rammer the reporter's lead flies swiftly over the notebook the sign painter is lettering with blue and gold the canal boy trots on the towpath the bookkeeper counts at his desk the shoemaker waxes his thread the conductor beats time for the band and all the performers follow him the child is baptized the convert is making his first profession the regatta is spread on the bay the race is begun how the white sails sparkle the drover watches his drove sings out to them that would stray the peddler sweats with his pack on his back the purchaser higgling about the odd scent the bride unrumples her white dress the minute hand of the clock moves slowly the opium eater reclines with rigid head and just opened lips the prostitute draggles her shawl her bonnet bobs on her tipsy and pimpled neck the crowd laugh at her blackguard oaths the men jeer and wink to each other miserable i do not laugh at your oaths nor jeer you the president holding a cabinet council is surrounded by the great secretaries on the piazza walk three matrons stately and friendly with twined arms the crew of the fish smack pack repeated layers of halibut in the hold the Missourian crosses the plains, toting his wares and his cattle. As the fair collector goes through the train, he gives notices by the jingling of loose change. The floor men are laying the floor, the tinners are tinning the roof, the masons are calling for mortar. In single file, each shouldering his hod, pass onward the laborers seasons pursuing each other the indescribable crowd is gathered it is the fourth of seventh month what salutes of cannon and small arms seasons pursuing each other the plower plows the mower mows and the winter grain falls in the ground off on the lakes the pike fisher watches and waits by the hole in the frozen surface the stumps stand thick round the clearing. The squatter strikes deep with his axe. Float boatmen make fast towards dusk near the cottonwood or pecan trees. Coon seekers go through the regions of the Red River or through those drained by the Tennessee or through those of the Arkansas. Torches shine in the dark that hangs on the Chattahoochee or the Altamaha. Patriarchs sit at supper with sons and grandsons and great-grandsons around them. In walls of adobe, in canvas tents, rest hunters and trappers after their day's sport. The city sleeps and the country sleeps. The living sleep for their time, the dead sleep for their time. The old husband sleeps by his wife, and the young husband sleeps by his wife. And these tend inward to me, and I tend outward to them. And such as it is to be of these, more or less I am. And of these one and all, I weave the song of myself. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. On the Morning of Christ's Nativity by John Milton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. On the Morning of Christ's Nativity. This is the month, and this the happy morn wherein the son of heaven's eternal king, of wedded maid and virgin mother, born, our great redemption from above did bring, for so the holy sages once did sing, 
that he our deadly forfeit should release, and with his father work us a perpetual peace. That glorious form, that light unsufferable, and that far-beaming blaze of majesty, wherewith he wont at heaven's high council table to sit the midst of trinal unity, he laid aside, and, here with us to be, forsook the courts of everlasting day, and chose with us a darksome house of mortal clay. Say, heavenly muse, shall not thy sacred vein afford a present to the infant God? Hast thou no verse, no hymn, or solemn strain, to welcome him to this his new abode? Now while the heaven, by the sun's team untrod, hath took no print of the approaching light, and all the spangled host keep watch in squadrons bright? See how from far upon the eastern road the star-led wizards haste with odor sweet. O oh, run, prevent them with thy humble ode, and lay it lowly at his blessed feet. Have thou the honor first thy lord to greet, and join thy voice unto the angel choir from out his secret altar touched with hallowed fire. The Hymn it was the winter wild, while the heaven-born child, all meanly wrapped in the rude manger lies, nature in awe to him, had doffed her gaudy trim, with her great master so to sympathize. It was no season then for her to wanton with the sun, her lusty paramour. Only with speeches fair she woos the gentle air to hide her guilty front with innocent snow, and on her naked shame pollute with sinful blame, the saintly veil of maiden white to throw, confounded, that her maker's eyes should look so near upon her foul deformities. But he, her fears to cease, sent down the meek-eyed peace. She, crowned with olive green, came softly sliding down the turning sphere, his ready harbinger, with turtle wing the amorous clouds dividing, and, waving wide her myrtle wand, she strikes a universal peace through sea and land. No war or bat tail sound was heard the world around. The idle spear and shield were high uphung. The hooked chariot stood, unstained with hostile blood. The trumpet spake not to the armed throng and king sat still with awful eye, as if they surely knew their sovereign lord was by. But peaceful was the night, wherein the prince of light, his reign of peace upon the earth began. The winds, with wonder whist, smoothly the waters kissed, whispering new joys to the mild ocean, who now hath quite forgot to rave, while birds of calm sit brooding on the charmed wave. The stars with deep amaze stand fixed in steadfast gaze, bending one way their precious influence, and will not take their flight for all the morning light or Lucifer that often warned them thence. But in their glimmering orbs did glow until their Lord himself bespake and bid them go. And though the shady gloom had given day her room, the sun himself withheld his wonted speed, and hid his head of shame, as his interior flame the new enlightened world no more should need. He saw a greater sun appear than his bright throne or burning axle-tree could bear. The shepherds on the lawn, or ere the point of dawn, sat simply chatting in a rustic row. Full little thought they, then that the mighty Pan was kindly to come with them below. Perhaps their loves, or else their sheep, was all that did their silly thoughts so busy keep. When such music sweet their hearts and ears did greet, as never was by mortal finger struck, divinely warbled voice answering the stringed noise, as all their souls in blissful rapture took, the air, such pleasure loth to lose, with thousand echoes, still prolongs each heavenly close. Nature, that heard such sound, 
Beneath the hollow round Of Cynthia's seat The airy region thrilling, Now was almost won To think her part was done, And that her reign Had here its last fulfilling. She knew such harmony alone Could hold all heaven and earth In happier union. At last surrounds their sight A globe of circular light, That with long beams The shame-faced knight arrayed, The helmed cherubim And sworded seraphim Are seen in glittering ranks With wings displayed, Harping in loud and solemn choir With unexpressive notes To heaven's new-born air. Such music, as tis said, before was never made, But when of old the sons of morning sung, While the Creator great his constellation set, And the well-balanced world on hinges hung, And cast the dark foundations deep, And bid the weltering waves their oozy channel keep. Ring out, ye crystal spheres, once bless our human ears, if ye have power to touch our senses so, And let your silver chime move in melodious time, And let the bass of heaven's deep organ blow, And with your ninefold harmony Make up full consort of the angelic symphony. For if such holy song enwrap our fancy long, Time will run back and fetch the age of gold, And speckled vanity will sicken soon and die. And leprous sin will melt from earthly mold, And hell itself will pass away, And leave her dolorous mansions of the peering day. Yes, truth and justice, then, Will down return to men, The enameled aris of the rainbow wearing, And mercy set between, Throned in celestial sheen, With radiant feet the tissued clouds down steering, and heaven, as at some festival, Will open wide the gates of her high palace hall. But wisest fate says no, This must not yet be so, The babe lies yet in smiling infancy, That on the bitter cross must redeem our loss, So both himself and us to glorify. Yet first, to those chained in sleep, The wakeful trump of doom must thunder through the deep. With such a horrid clang, as on Mount Sinai rang, While the red fire and smouldering clouds outbreak, The aged earth, aghast with terror of that blast, Shall from the surface to the center shake, When, at the world's last session, The dreadful judge in middle air shall spread his throne. And then at last our bliss, full and perfect is, But now begins. For from this happy day, the old dragon underground, In straighter limits bound, not half so far, Casts his usurped sway, and, wroth to see his kingdom fail, Swinges the scaly horror of his folded tail. The oracles are dumb, no voice or hideous hum Runs through the arched roof in words deceiving. Apollo from his shrine can no more divine, Will hollow shriek the step of Delphos leaving. No nightly trance or breathed spell Inspires the pale-eyed priest from the prophetic cell. The lonely mountains o'er, and the resounding shore, A voice of weeping heard and loud lament, Edged with poplar pale from haunted spring and dale, the parting genius is with sighing scent, With flower inwoven tresses torn, The nymphs in twilight shade of tangled thickets mourn. In consecrated earth, and on the holy hearth, The lars and limerace moan with midnight plaint, In urns and altars round, a drear and dying sound, Affrights the flamens at their service quaint, And the chill marble seems to sweat, while each peculiar power foregoes his wonted seat. Peor and Balaam forsake their temples dim, With that twice-battered god of Palestine, And mooned Ashtaroth, heaven's queen and mother both, Now sits not girth with taper's holy shine. The Libic Haman shrinks his horn, 
In vain the Turian maids their wounded Tammuz mourn. And sullen Moloch, fled, hath left in shadows dread His burning idol all of blackest hue. In vain with symbols ring they call the grisly king. In dismal dance about the furnace blue, The brutish gods of Nile as fast, Isis and Horus, and the dog Anubis, haste. Nor is Osiris seen, in Memphian grove or green, Trampling the unshowered grass with lowings loud. Nor can he be at rest within his sacred chest, Naught but profoundest hell can be his shroud. In vain with timbreled anthems dark, The sable-stoled sorcerers bear his worshipped ark. He feels from Judah's land the dreaded infant's hand, The rays of Bethlehem blind his dusky eye. Nor all the gods beside longer dare abide, Not Typhon huge, ending in snaky twine, Our babe, to show his godhead true, Can in his swaddling bands control the damned crew. So, when the sun in bed, curtained with cloudy red, Pillows his shane upon an orient wave, The flocking shadows pale, troop to the infernal jail. Each fettered ghost slips to his several grave, And the yellow-skirted fays fly after the night steeds, Leaving their moon-loved maze. But see, the virgin blessed had laid her babe to rest, Time as our tedious song should here have ending, Heaven's youngest team star hath fixed her polished car, Her sleeping lord with handmaid lamp attending, And all about the courtly stable, Bright harnessed angels sit in order serviceable. End of On the Morning of Christ's Nativity by John Milton The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly, I remember, it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow, from the books surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here for evermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain, rustling of each purple curtain, thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. So that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This is it, and nothing more. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, Truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door, darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, the darkness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping, somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see, then, what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when with many a flirt and flutter, 
and there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace, just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling, my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Platonian shore. Quote the raven, nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly, foul to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such a name as nevermore. But the raven sitting lonely on the placid bust spoke only, that one word as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing further than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than uttered. Other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store. Caught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster, till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore, of never, never more. But the raven still beguiling, all my sad soul into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking, fancy unto fancy, thinking, what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore, meant in croaking, nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing, to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining, on the cushion's velvet lining, that the lamplight gloated o'er but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er, she shall press, ah, nevermore. Then, methought, the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by seraphin whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy goth hath lent thee, by these angels he hath sent thee, respite, respite, and knee penth from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff, this kind knee penth, and forgot this loth, Lenore. Quote the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil. Prophet still, if bird or devil. Whether tempest sent, or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore. Desolate, yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted. On this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore. Is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quote the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by the heavens that bend above us, by the God we both adore. Tell the soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden, it shall clasp a sainted maiden, whom the angels name Lenore. Clasp a rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels name Lenore. Quote the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked upstarting, Get thee back into the tempest and the night's Platonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quote the raven, nevermore. And the raven never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting, on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor, and my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. End of the Raven Portrait of a Lady by T. S. Eliot 
Recorded for LibriVox.org by Catherine Eastman. Thou hast committed fornication, but that was in another country, and besides, the wench is dead. The Jew of Malta. 1. Among the smoke and fog of a December afternoon, you have the scene arrange itself, as it will seem to do, with, I have saved this afternoon for you, and four wax candles in the darkened room, four rings of light upon the ceiling overhead, an atmosphere of Juliet's tomb, prepared for all the things to be said, or left unsaid. We have been, let us say, to hear the latest pole transmit the preludes through his hair and fingertips. So intimate, the Chopin, that I think his soul should be resurrected only among friends, some two or three, who will not touch the bloom that is rubbed and questioned in the concert room. And so the conversation slips among velleities and carefully caught regrets, through attenuated tones of violins mingled with remote cornets, and begins. You do not know how much they mean to me, my friends, and how, how rare and strange it is to find in a life composed so much, so much of odds and ends, for indeed I do not love it, you knew, you are not blind, how keen you are, to find a friend who has these qualities, who has and gives those qualities upon which friendship lives. How much it means that I say this to you, without these friendships, life, what cauchemar, among the windings of the violins and the ariettes of cracked cornets, Inside my brain a dull tom-tom begins, absurdly hammering a prelude of its own, capricious monotone that is at least one definite false note. Let us take the air in a tobacco trance, admire the monuments, discuss the late events, correct our watches by the public clocks, then sit for half an hour and drink our box. Two. Now that lilacs are in bloom, she has a bowl of lilacs in her room, and twists one in her fingers while she talks. Ah, my friend, you do not know, you do not know what life is. You should hold it in your hands, slowly twisting the lilac stalks. You let it flow from you, you let it flow and youth is cruel and has no remorse, and smiles at situations which it cannot see. I smile, of course, and go on drinking tea. Yet with these April sunsets that somehow recall my buried life and Paris in the spring, I feel immeasurably at peace, and find the world to be wonderful and youthful after all. The voice returns like the insistent out-of-tune of a broken violin on an August afternoon. I am always sure that you understand my feelings, always sure that you feel, sure that across the gulf you reach your hand. You are invulnerable, you have no Achilles' heel, you will go on, and when you have prevailed you can say, at this point, many a one has failed. But what have I, but what have I, my friend, to give you? What can you receive from me? Only the friendship and the sympathy of one about to reach her journey's end. I shall sit here, serving tea to friends. I take my hat. How can I make a cowardly amends for what she has said to me? You will see me any morning in the park, reading the comics and the sporting page. Particularly, I remark, an English countess goes upon the stage. A Greek was murdered at a Polish dance. Another bank defaulter has confessed. I keep my countenance. I remain self-possessed, except 
when a street piano, mechanical and tired, reiterates some worn-out common song, with a smell of hyacinths across the garden, recalling things that other people have desired. Are these ideas right or wrong? 3. The October night comes down, returning as before, except for a slight sensation of being ill at ease. I mount the stairs and turn the handle of the door, and feel as if I had mounted on my hands and knees. And so you are going abroad, and when do you return? But that's a useless question. You hardly know when you are coming back. You will find so much to learn. My smile falls heavily among the bric-a-brac. Perhaps you can write to me. My self-possession flares up for a second. This is as I had reckoned. I have been wondering frequently of late, but our beginnings never know our ends, why we have not developed into friends. I feel like one who smiles, and turning, shall remark suddenly his expression in a glass. My self-possession gutters. We are really in the dark. For everybody said so. All our friends, they all were sure our feelings would relate so closely. I myself can hardly understand. We must leave it now to fate. You will write, at any rate. Perhaps it is not too late. I shall sit here serving tea to friends. And I must borrow every changing shape to find expression. Dance, dance like a dancing bear, cry like a parrot, chatter like an ape. Let us take the air in a tobacco trance. Well, and what if she should die some afternoon? Afternoon gray and smoky, evening yellow and rose. Should die and leave me sitting pen in hand, with the smoke coming down above the housetops. Doubtful, for quite a while, not knowing what to feel, or if I understand, or whether wise or foolish, tardy or too soon, would she not have the advantage, after all? This music is successful with a dying fall, now that we talk of dying. And should I have the right to smile? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.